Uh, my name is Shugoto, and I teach in the history of art department. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce Professor Catherine Asher as one of her students. It is all the more thrilling for me to introduce her to my students sitting there. <coughs> but of course, Kathy Asher needs no introduction for anyone working on South Asian or Islamic art. Her architecture of Mughal India, published in 1992, was a groundbreaking book on early modern <coughs> architecture in South Asia and a staple for anyone, all of us, working on built form. Kathy has published innumerable essays and books on South Asian art since then, including India Before Europe, co-authored with Cynthia Talbot, Perceptions of South Asia's Visual Past, co-edited with Professor Metcalf, and more recently, Delhi's Kutub Complex, the Minar, Mosque, and Meheroli. Her talk today uh, will draw on the new project on the Kutub Complex, and I, I'm sure everyone is very eagerly waiting to hear from her. I also wanted to very briefly introduce the South Asia Art Initiative, of which Kathy Ash's talk is a part. We have a series of events, and we have a flyer a range of talks from South Asian, from early modern to contemporary art as part of a new initiative launched at the Institute for South Asia Studies. But without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Asher. Um, it's very nice of you to come when the weather's so lovely, so I appreciate it. Um, I will start immediately since we are starting late. <laughs> The structures at the Kutub, let's say this is not working. India's first official, am I doing it the wrong way? Yes. Okay, now I got it. For India's first official mosque complex reveal a marriage of Iranian and Indian traditions. Well, most of you are probably somewhat familiar with this famous site. Let's recap. The mosque was commenced in the late 12th century. The, temp the iconic minaret just a few years later, and the complex was active into the 14th century, and even today it remains important. In 1193, Gurud forces from Afghanistan, part of the larger Iranian world, under the authority of the ruler Muizuddin, took Delhi and established a capital there. The Gurids a formidable power in the Eastern Persianate world were great patrons of art. They provided brick edifices following traditions of earlier Ghaznavid ones, including freestanding minarets. The Gurids, and again I remind you, <coughs> rulers of the larger Iranian world used both architecture, and here's a Gurid tomb, <coughs> and monumental inscriptions as propaganda as we will see at the Kutub complex. The most famous structure of the Afghan <coughs> dynasty is the towering minaret at Jam, dated 1174 75, that was built at Muizuddin's brother's headquarters at Firuz Kot, today called Jam. The scale and inscriptions of the Gurid Afghan structures were used not only to glorify themselves but also to promote themselves as adherents of the then popular Karamiya sect. This was an ascetic form of Islam that was considered by many as outside the pale of orthodox Sunni Islam. Later, by the time the Gurids entered Delhi, the rulers had rejected their orthodox, unorthodox Karamiya affiliation. <coughs> I beg the first Gurid commander in Delhi needed a mosque, for in the Islamic tradition, to legitimize a new ruler's authority, his name must be read in the Friday prayer. Following long established its Muslim practice, the first mosque of the new area was quickly built from reused temple pillars. Since the 19th century, writers have been obsessed with this use of spoilia. It's usually assumed that the Gurus' entry into India, which was often thought of as rapacious, was their first contact with Indian ascetics, and by extension, that they were shocked by images of deities. 
However, Indian artisans had been working in Afghanistan since at least the 11th century, as we see in this carved frieze with an Indic style woman. This stone constructed edifice within Gurud territory is an oft cited example of Indian workmanship that includes the use of corbel domes and arches in lieu of true vaulting. This shouldn't surprise us because, um, since, it should, sorry, it shouldn't surprise us since Mahmoud of Ghazna brought back to Afghanistan Indian artisans. Their descendants were trained in these traditions. The visual landscape of India was nowhere as alien to the Gurids as it usually believes and has implications for the reuse of, of temple pillars. Before I discuss the pillars, let's consider the mosque's name. The mosque complex is now known as the Quwaq al-Islam, meaning the strength um, of Islam. The use of this name today underscores a sense of bellicose behavior often attributed to the Gurdas and Muslim dynasties in general, but it was not the original ones. Inscriptions on the mosque dating to the late 12th century call it simply a building or mosque. As shown by Sunil Kumar, the name Kuwait al-Islam is a corruption of the 13th century sobriquet for the city of Delhi, the Kuwait al-Islam, um, meaning the sanctuary or dome of Islam. I will refer to the multiple structures at the site as the Kutub complex, a name that better suits the builder's original intentions. These infamous pillars form the interior of form the interior of a rectangular mosque type found in much of the Persianate world. A Persian inscription indicates Ibek built this mosque at the behest of his Buddhist overlord and that it was underway by 1196. The entrance and all its arches built before the 14th century are not true arches for they lack a keystone. Rather, the stacked stones are pushed together to form a point in a technique known as corbeling. On either side of the main entrance are, uh, are niches with geometric designs, not the anthropomorphic type <coughs> imagery seen on similar niches on a temple, since in a religious context, Islam discourages the presence of human life imagery. This entrance leads to a large courtyard. Near its center stands an iron pillar, while a monumental stone screen had been placed in 1198 before the mosque's prayer chamber. The pillar was not likely in this location at the time of the mosque's initial construction. It is the pillar galleries, all made from spoilia, that formed the mosque's original portion. Reuse, as I noted earlier, is the traditional mode of mosque construction when political Islam first enters new territory. Originally, from temple porches, these pillars are relatively short and needed to be double stacked to obtain an adequate height. Little attempt was made to match pillars so the, visual the result is in a visual array of organic foliage, foliage, mythic creatures, and deities that have been defaced or neatly removed. Were these pil reused pillars <coughs> a statement of a new Muslim supremacy, or did the Gurids so admire Indian <coughs> craft that only the elements of anthropomorphism discouraged in Islam were removed. Those who believe the original name of the mosque was the Qawwad al-Islam would tend to support the view that the rearranged temple pillars were a statement of good victory and Islamic supremacy. But we must recall that earlier Afghan patronage shows an appreciation of Indian aesthetics. It may be useful to 
think of this reuse as Finbar Flood recently has suggested. He sees it not as random, for it was done carefully, using the most beautiful portions and removing with care imagery that is deemed unacceptable in the Islamic context. It is a translation of older materials into a new purpose, in this case, for a ordered audience. A case in point is the arrangement of the pillars in the prayer chamber. They are considerably more uniform than in the other galleries. These pillars <coughs> were chosen carefully for they prominently display the carved chains with bells commonly found on temple pillars. To the eyes of a Muslim newly arrived in India, they would easily appear similar to lamps and chains often found on a mosque mehrab. On the right is one from Ghazni. The depiction of a lamp in a Muslim religious context references a famous Quranic verse that likens a light in a niche to God's presence. Unfortunately, much of the Qibla wall, that is the wall that faces in the direction of Mecca, is missing. Not even a mihrab, usually in the form of an arched mit niche, remains. Likely, there were several mihrabs once embedded in this wall to indicate the direction of prayer. When the surviving portion of this mosque's west <coughs> exterior wall is viewed, one sees a sole projecting niche that is not centrally placed. This mosque exterior projection would have been complemented by a cent centrally placed one and another balancing one to ensure a symmetrical arrangement common in Islamic in Iranian design. This is an Indian innovation for elsewhere in the Islamic world at this time, mosques had a single mihrab. The South Asian predilection for multiple mihrabs may have developed from temples where images of deities framed in multiple niches on, were framed on multiple niches on the exterior. The earliest extant Buddha mihrab in India is at Ibex Ajmer Mosque, made of marble, it is dated 1199 and hints to the possible appearance of the Delhi mihrabs. A massive stone, ooh, I'm not too far. <laughs> a massive stone screen with five corbelled arches was <coughs> placed in front of the prayer chamber in 1198, transforming its overall appearance. While some argue it was to conceal the reused pillars, it was more likely to make the mosque appear like those in contemporary <coughs> Afghanistan and Iran, which had large iwans or arched facades. They now appeared like those to which Delhi's ethnically diverse military and service folk were accustomed. We can take this further. For commencing with the refurbishment of the great mosque in Isfahan in the 11th century by the Seljuk minister Nizam al -Mulk, the reintroduction of the massive Sasanian arched facade was a symbol of absolute kingly power. Muizuddin wished to promote this same I image of good authority. The screen is covered with bands of carving that mimic ones on near contemporary textiles. They also recall horizontal bands found on temples that here turned vertical. The screen consists of carved lotus creepers growing from pots, part of a long Indic tradition, and calligraphic panels whose letters are intertwined with a naturalistic lotus creeper. This gooded inscription with vines crossing letters may have been a source of inspiration, but on the Ibex screen, the lotus creeper almost seems to overtake the text. The screen's carving is much more naturalistic than that of the Ghaznavid work, more in keeping with Indic forms that favor naturalism 
as on Ibex screen. Flowers from the lotus creeper overtake the script. Some flowers are mere buds, and others are fully open and face the viewer, while many of the open flowers face inward towards the prayer chamber's Kibla wall. Flowers, of course, face the source of light. Here, the bells and chains, imagined as lamps whose light is a metaphor for God's presence. In the spandrels of the central arch are complex circular patterns. They may be Indic versions of Persianate brick patterns, and they resemble Indian corbel domes. They recall block printed tactiles, which were in international demand. The stones, multiple shades of red, green, and pink, are reminiscent of textiles that have been printed or dyed in many colors. These designs are both Indic and Islamic, reflecting the Gurus' interests both in South Asia and in territories far to the west. This screen is replete with monumental inscriptions following a pattern established earlier in Gurud, Afghanistan. The Delhi inscriptions stand against the background of organic floral imagery, just obscuring the text with difference from those Afghan Gurud ones, which are rendered in high and low relief with little other background. Most of the Delhi inscriptions are Quranic. Their content has generated much attention, perhaps more than is warranted, given the entangled script. Some believe the inscriptional content proclaiming Islam as the correct path is directed against Hindus and Jains, but even they concede that many of the verses are directed at believers, for they focus on the obligations of a good <coughs> Muslim. Others suggest that the inscriptions focusing on non-believers are not so much directed at those who adhere to Indic religions but are targeted towards unorthodox Muslims, including the Karamiya, who the now orthodox Buddhists consider to be heretics. Ibex's screen was constructed around the very time when Wizibin switched his allegiance from the somewhat parochial Karamiya sect of Islam to a school much more acceptable among orthodox Sunni thinkers. The towering minaret, known as the Kutub Minar, is located to the south of Ibex's original mosque. Often described as Delhi's iconic image, this minaret could once be seen from a considerable distance. The Kutub was built in multiple stages, first by Ibex, then by his successor, El Tukmish, and repaired by others up to the present. It remains the world's tallest minaret before steel ones were built in the 20th century. The name Kutub Minar is not original, for in its inscriptions it's only termed a minar. Its name derives from an important Sufi, Kutubuddin Bakhtiar Khaki, who belonged to the Shishti order and died in 1235. His burial site in Dagda are close to the Kutub complex and remain an important spiritual center. The Shishtiya originated in the Gurid site of Shisht in Afghanistan, and although today its followers are largely in South Asia or its diaspora. The base of the Kutub, the part completed <coughs> under Ibek, is polygonal consisting of alternating angular and rounded projections and was inspired by 11th century minarets. While the immediate model for the Kutub was the one at Jam, built by Muizuddin's brother. The uniformity of the Kutub and its well-planned proportions suggest it was planned, although not executed, in a single campaign. Inscriptions suggest that it was underway by 1199. There are two types of inscriptions, <coughs> those Quranic ones in Arabic and historical ones in Persian. The Quranic ones 
with admonitions to non-believers were most likely targeted at full followers of unorthodox Muslim sects. The early Sultanate military and administrative forces came from multiple traditions, including Shias, Ismails, these, and in all probability, followers of the Qadimiyya sect, now, remember, considered heretical. Reading the inscriptions would be difficult, although the script is clear, for the viewer would have to completely circumambulate the minaret. It is unlikely that anyone above the, I'm sorry, it is unlikely that anyone could read those above the first two bands while standing on the ground. All the same, ooh, sorry, the minaret's basic religious orientation would be clear for the name of God, Allah, even e that even the unlettered Muslim could easily identify is on lower tiers. The Persian inscriptions proclaim the good of brothers as the masters of the kings of Arabia and Iran, the most just sultans of the world, and celebrate them as the fonts of justice, kindness, and mercy. These iconiums are addressed to the former brother elite who had rebelled establishing their own seats of power in India, Rajputs who remained largely independent, and those Muslim forces outside of India who remained a threat. How, without instant messaging and contemporary modes of communication, could this message of good superiority be disseminated? The pre-modern world was highly mobile and information spread quickly. Merchants trading highly sought after commodities were constantly moving between India and lands to the east and west. Carrier pigeons conveyed messages over long distances. The Gurids were not an insular power and by now held international respect. Gurid rule lasted until Muizuddin was assassinated in 1206. Ibek, his general, was able to assert himself as an independent ruler in his death in 1210. We might ask why the Gurids and then Ibek and his successors chose to stay in India. One answer is for monetary gain, and, uh, sorry, monetary and territorial gain. A second off-sighted reason is the desire to rid the land of infidels and repopulate it with Muslims. Mm -hmm. Despite the hyperbole of jihadist rhetoric in Sultanate period texts, there is little evidence to suggest the wholesale destruction of temples or a massive conversion to Islam claimed by chroniclers. Recent work has shown that only temples deemed to have political Significance were destroyed by Muslim armies, just as in earlier times Hindu kings destroyed the temples of their Hindu enemies. An increased Muslim population was caused by a massive number of ethnically diverse immigrants coming to serve the Gurids in multiple roles. They married local women whose offspring were Muslim. Upon Ibek's death, Il Tutmish was proclaimed Sultan. He inherited an unstable state, but by the end of his reign was able to secure a newly independent sultanate. In 1229, when Il Tutmish's rivals in India had been eliminated, the Caliph in Baghdad recognized him as the legitimate ruler of the Delhi Sultanate, thus enhancing Il Tutmish's status in the larger Islamic world. Even before this, he had continued the good policy of supporting Orthodox Muslim institutions, presenting himself as the guardian of Islam. Mongol forces were coming ever closer to Delhi, causing the Sultanate's diverse, multi-ethnic community to stay unified. El Tutmish promoted the idea of unity among Delhi's Muslims, in part by the construction of mosques, and by works such as this once used reservoir. A Persian historian described Delhi as the sanctuary of Islam, meaning a safe haven for Muslims. 
Delhi served as a center for the unified sultanate established under the authority of El Tutmish. El Tutmish continued to embellish his capital by expanding Ibex's original mosque and making additions to the Qutub Minar, which was now enclosed within <coughs> the new courtyard. All of El Tutmish's additions are newly carved material and continued the use of corbel arches. El Tutmich's massive screen, dated 1229, the same year he gained colorful recognition, flanked Ibex screen on either side. Its stone was chosen for its red tones. Red in Islam <coughs> has long been associated with royalty, as also in India. The organic forms of Ibex screens are replaced with high and low relief of a type seen on the Qutub Minar and on Gurdjieff Mosque, for example, the one in Herat, dated 1200. The increased presence of Muslim immigrants fleeing from the Mongols may have encouraged Il Tutmish to use an aesthetic similar to those he wished, to, similar, familiar to those with whom he wished to bond as part of a unified Muslim community. He also wished to project himself as a universal sultan, not a provincial ruler. Early Indian sultans were not only interested in portraying themselves as great kings, but as rightful rulers. A case in point is the placement of the fifth century iron pillar in front of Ibex's screen. The pillar was cast to celebrate a 5th century military victory, and it is an object of fascination, for although made of iron, it appears not to rust. It is widely acknowledged this remarkable pillar did not originate from Delhi, although the original location is unknown. But who did install it in its current position begs an answer. Earlier Rajput kings have been proposed while a 14th century history indicates the pillar was placed by El Tutmish. Whatever the historical fact may be, within a hundred years after his death, El Tutmish was remembered for planting this ancient pillar at a mosque just as earlier Rajas had placed pillars at temples. In the 14th century, El Tutmish was credited with celebrating political victories in a manner that continues, not ruptures, Indic tradition. Only the first stage of the Qutub Minar was completed upon Ibex's death. Il Tutmish then added three more stories replete with inscriptional bands. While the vast majority of these epigraphs are in communes praising Il Tutmish, at least two of the bands contain Quranic inscriptions, but most of them are too high to read. So we might ask, what is their purpose? Large-scale Quranic passages may simply affirm faith in God, in this case, a unified Muslim community, and El Tutmish as an ideal Muslim sultan. We can imagine that that was the ruler's intention. This minaret was higher than its good precedent in Jam, but like it, the Qutub serves as a watchtower. From the top, the voluminous dust raised by an approaching army could be seen from afar. El Tukmish's domain was far from stable, as areas he captured would often become independent again. To the northwest, the Mongols remained a threat. In this expanding complex, El Tukmish constructed his tomb, a building type until now rarely found in an Indic context. Tombs had been built in the Iranian Islamic world since at least the 10th century. And Il Tutmish's tomb was surmounted by a corbel dome, which is now fallen. The tomb is modeled on similar ones under the, built under the Gurids in Afghanistan, which in turn were based on 10th century ones. The carving on the Delhi tomb is highly tactile, as if brick construction the material dominant in Afghanistan and Iran had been translated into stone. 
the tombs hit the wall, marked by three mihrabs, which is unique at this time and not found in the Iranian world. I have suggested that there were multiple mihrabs in the Qutub Mosque, setting a precedent for the three mihrabs in El Tufish's tomb. Here, there is a central marble mihrab and red sandstone ones flanking each side of the central one. White marble appears to be reserved for special portions of the building, for example, the tomb sarcophagus. Il Tutmish's tomb and its use of marble establish a tradition in Indian architecture that lasts many centuries. For the next 60 years, we have little evidence of work at the complex until the reign of Sultan Alauddin Khilji in the early 14th century. This sultan gained vast territory, wealth, and power. Mongols, however, remained a considerable threat. In 1303, Alauddin was able to defeat the Mongols, but only because they retreated, realizing snow would soon close passes threatening their return. In celebration of his victory, Alauddin also enlarged the Qutub complex mosques. Although his additions were never fully executed, had they been completed, the complex would have been about six size times the size of the original one. An indication of the planned enlargement is its enormous unfinished minaret. The only finished portion of his mosque is the south entrance known as the Alain Gavaza, the Exalted Gateway. Dated to 1311, it is a square plan structure surmounted by a true dome. High quality carving rendered in geometric patterns and fine calligraphy covers the building. The Persian inscriptions name the Sultan a second Alexander the Great, evoking not only the feats of the historical figure, <laughs> but also those extraordinary ones of Sikandar, of Pyrdosi's epic Persian Shahnameh. These iconiums claim he's Darius-like in splendor, evoking uh, the rule of the great Achmedid ruler. The beauty of the carved script was praised by the 14th century poet Amir Khusro, <coughs> noting that it was so exquisite you would think the Quran was coming down from heaven. While the majority of the inscriptions are not Quranic, but Persian historical prose, Amir Khusro's praise is an indication of pride for the building. Part of this admiration may have come from its new aesthetic. Rather than the beige stone found on earlier faces, here deep red sandstone is marked with white marble trim. What was the source of this striking new aesthetic? May it have been the result of a quest for a new visual to celebrate the Mongol defeat. After all, red sandstone and white marble were accessible in Rajasthani quarries, although they had been used sparingly. Over a half a century ago, his historian suggested that the use of contrasting colored stones may have been the product of artisans from Seljuk, Turkey, fleeing the Mongols. Seljuk buildings feature contrasting colored stones to highlight the surface's design. There are also Indic origins to this use of red and white. According to a Hindu text on architecture, white is associated with Brahmins, while red is associated with warriors and kings. Red was also the color of the early Delhi Sultan's royal umbrellas and tents. This choice of colors was likely intentional and used notably 200 years later by the Mughals who had been keen to highlight both their personate and Indic roots. After Alauddin, construction at the site decreased considerably. And this might be a good moment to consider if inspiration was largely coming from the Persianate world to India or whether there was two-way traffic. The dearth of portable extant objects from India at this time makes the response somewhat difficult. Another factor are the Mongols whose raids across Central Asia, Iran, and into the subcontinent tended to move people toward the east 
not the West. And in addition, as we know, the Mongols and Elkanids favored Chinese products rather than Indian ones. In Delhi, the mosque and especially the minar, the complex's most palpable link with Iranian tradition, remained significant for later centuries. But why, since the site continued in significance, is the mosque ruined, although not the minar? There are no historical records regarding the mosque's condition, only these do exist for the minar. Most of the mosque employed inadequate construction methods, especially arches. Earthquakes have shaken the complex. We know the minar's top portion had toppled at least twice, almost surely hitting and damaging the mosque itself. Timur's sack of Delhi in the late 14th century may also have affected the mosque. Unchecked vegetation, seen in these images, is another source for structural decay. Its stones were also plundered for the construction of new buildings. The minaret, damaged in earthquakes in both the 14th and 16th centuries, was <coughs> repaired each time. <coughs> when Farouz Shah repaired and added two stories to the Kutub Minar after it had been struck by lightning, in 1369, he was linking himself with the establishment of Muslim political power in North India. He inscribed his name on the minar's top. Hindu workmen, responsible for all the repairs, left an inscription likening the minar to the abode of Vishnakarman, the divine architect of the world in his Indic tradition. This suggests none of the contempt for Muslim rule that Hindus living under the Sultanate are so often imagined to have felt. Purusha Tughlaq's addition to the minaret is embellished with red and white stone, but I doubt that that was the original Tughlaq veneer. The minaret was again re restored by Sikhandar Lodi when it was struck again once again by lightning in 1503. Since the Tughlaq period, Nagri inscriptions are on the beige stone in keeping with the stone on the lower stories. It suggests that the red and white facing are later additions. Instead of ascribing his name relatively high on the minaret as earlier sultans have, had done, Sikhandar Lodi recorded his inscriptions just above the ground level entrance, so they were highly visible. They probably included the facing of red sandstone and white marble that would have been added to the upper two stories. To understand why Sikhandar Lodi added these contrasting co colors to the minaret's top, it's important to grasp this sultan's political goal that are suggested by his inscription over the ground level entrance. That's really a nice <coughs> note right now. Thank you. It predominantly ascribes the initial patronage to Il Titmish, not to Ibek, or even to Muizuddin, whose name appears on the first story. This suggests that either no one bothered to read the older inscriptions, or that long standing tradition attributed the Qutub Minar to Il Titmish. Despite Sikhandar Lodi's misunderstandings of the Minar's foundations, he is clearly linking his reign to that of an illustrious early sultan, who, like him, was the second ruler of his house. Il Tutmish is regarded as the first stabilizer of the Delhi Sultanate, for it was under him that stabilized authority was established, albeit somewhat shakily. Sikhandar Lodi also inherited a Delhi that needed to be stabilized since power and authority had been devastated by Timur's invasion of nearly a century earlier. Once Sikhandar Lodi defeated his major enemy, the Sharkis of Janpur, he saw himself as the revitalizer of the Delhi Sultanate. The Sharkis were considered the most cultivated of all the 15th century North Indian Sultanates and they were cognizant of contemporary Timur art in Iran. As Anna Sloan has shown, 
the Shirkis employed Timuri motifs on John Ford's mosques, which are originally painted to emulate Timuri, which were, I'm sorry, originally painted to emulate Timuri tile work. Sikandulodi too aspired to international acclaim, and he reintroduced color to Delhi's architecture. While most of the polychrome on Lodi buildings has faded or disappeared, their color, red and white, that he added to the top of the Kutub of Manar is highly visible. Sikandar Lodi's addition of red and white facing on the Kutub of Manar itself was a visual reference to Aluddin's Elijah Vaza and more generally to the reign of this sultan who was likened to the Achmenid the Achmenid Darius. During the late 14th through early 16th centuries, Alauddin's regime was seen as a golden age. The use of red and white stone on the Kutub appears to be a visual statement of his intent to revive Delhi's status. Little did he know that his own dynasty was only to last another 20 years. The Menar continues to have considerable impact into the present. The Shah Jahan modeled his hunting tower on the Qutub. Artists and photographers rendered its image. Models were even made to show Britons at home this remarkable structure. These examples are benign, but others have profoundly a negative impact. While many recognize the Minar's Iranian or origins, others believe, as Syed Ahmed Khan once thought, although without today's maliciousness, that the Minar is a temple stumba. Such misunderstandings incite and ignite hostility towards Muslims and Islam. But let me end on a more positive note. The Qutub is highly regarded even today as it continues to be copied. Not so surprising is a smaller version of the Qutub that is next door at the Sufi Dargah of Bakhtiar Kaki. It has long been under construction, and when and if completed, it will serve as a visual marker on the skyline for the Dargah's presence, just as the Qutub serves as a marker for the mosque complex. However, it's unlikely that the Dargah's Minar could ever achieve the status of the Qutub, a symbol of Delhi. More surprising are references to the Qutub at Ibeck's reconstructed tomb in Lahore, where he died from a polo accident in 1210. The tomb was rebuilt in 1971. While the tomb's designers clearly were referencing El Tutmish his tomb in Delhi in overall shape and plan. The average Pakistani who had never been to Delhi would almost surely miss these illusions. So to make the message clear, the interior <laughs> boundary walls of this tomb are lined with images of the Qutub Minar, a known reference in Pakistan. However, it's also possible that those viewers with little sense of chronology would see these projecting forms in the enclosure wall as references to Lahore's Minare Pakistan, <laughs> a symbol better linked to Tehran's Burj Azadi, both associated with nationalism rather than Delhi's Qutub. Thus, the Qutub becomes a remarkable double end symbol, one representing a sense of pride for two nation states, one's that do not really see eye to eye. Thank you. Can you take some questions? Sure. If I have the strength to answer. That's <laughs> all, of course, I will. Okay. Uh, I think we open it up straight for uh, questions. Okay. Thanks. I have the audience. Uh, I, if I could think a little bit more about the contemporary 20th century movement and how the Qutub is reimagined. I wonder how the Qutub plays with the Taj. 
because we think of Taj as a symbol of India. So thinking about Delhi and India and how we think, also thinking about the India-Pakistan relationship and what is India's national Well, I think for sure that nobody in Delhi knows about these references in Pakistan to the court of, I mean, I don't think it's just a one-way street in that manner. Um, that's a really interesting question, and I think it's actually a little bit hard to answer that, um, especially at this point <laughs> in the day. Uh, but, I mean, the, the, you're right, the Taj's scene is a kind of, I mean, it's, it's well, the Taj is pretty, I mean, it's not a straightforward symbol either. It's, I mean, we all know that the Taj is seen both as a symbol of romantic love, especially in the West, but to the, in today's India, as we all know, it's claimed by many of the right to be a, 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 a Hindu temple. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, you see, a, you see a parallel between, I mean, I, I really haven't made too much of a deal out of this, but actually there is, of course, a, you know, a fairly large outspoken body of people, you can find this especially on the web, that claim that the, the minaret was a, is not um, a, a minaret, really. It was transformed into one, and that it was originally some sort of Hindu building. You also find things that say that it was built as um, an ancient flying saucer base. I wish I were kidding you, um, <laughs> but uh, this, there's, there's many things. But I, I mean, I, you know, certainly the Taj is a lot better known. I don't think there's any denial of that, if that's partly what you're asking. I'm not quite sure <laughs> what you're asking me. <laughs> no, I, no, I, I mean, the, I think in a way, I was thinking about India versus Delhi. In, in terms of like Kutub being Delhi. Oh, I think, yeah, the Kutub, I'm seeing what you're saying. I think Kutub is definitely a symbol of Delhi, not a national. And then how does that make, relate to, let's say, if, if we are to read the, the Lahore tomb, does it signify any sort of inter intersection? You mean if I'm to read the Lahore tomb that way? Is, is, I, I is it referencing Delhi? Is it referencing Aiba? Is it referencing well, India in I, terms I of post-70s politics? You mean what it, what it means right now in the 21st century? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it was clearly meant as a, re a reference to Aiba to right. begin with, mm -hmm. and probably to the sultanate, the larger sultanate. Um, today, I, I, I mean, it's, it's a little, I don't know, I suppose it's I mean, I, I th my guess is, frankly, that most people who see it do not think of it as the Kutub. I think they think of it as probably the Minari Pakistan. I would imagine 99% of the people who see it have no historical sense. They don't real. they kind of know that Ibek is this old uh, sultan who, and the association with Lahore is where he died. He lived there only for about six years, I think, something like that. And it could be five, but whatever. And I, and I, I really wonder how much as much as the architects, and we know their names, I mean, a fair amount of this is known, really intended, I, and they intended to be a reference to, I think, the sultanate in general, but what exactly, I'm, not, I'm tired and not doing this well, um, <laughs> what exactly it, it would mean to someone today looking at it is a little unclear, and they might want to even deny the Indic okay. roots. I mean, just having come back, and th there's, I mean, certainly among intellectuals, there's no problem, but among average people, there's certainly a huge hostility um, to India at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, just to follow up directly on that, though, in 1971, wouldn't there still have been a generation of people who, I, I mean, uh, it makes complete sense to me. Narayan Gupta has just done a lovely children's book on the Kutub, which is sort of all about Delhi ballers and their love of the Kutub. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of wonder if in 1971 there would have still have been a generation, um, some Muhajir, some not, who had sentimental. Well, I think so. I mean, and, and, they w and so I think that's an interesting question. They may well have been evoking not India, mm -hmm. but some rom romanticized memory of Delhi. I, I think that's and probably true and very different from today's rom romanticized yeah. view of what history. Of the Sultanate, basing the Sultanate more in what was then Pakistan as opposed to <coughs> Delhi or yeah, larger yeah, India. Yeah. But we know the names of the architects, and, and they were old enough to probably yeah, have remembered right. and remember yeah. that, yeah. Um, actually, I was able to find out a lot about how it was constructed. I didn't, I'm sparing you all that. But we do know a fair amount of what went into the process, so it's pretty interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, just following up on, on uh, Shubhata's point, uh, what, what does it mean to be the symbol of a 
place uh, time. I mean, most people, you know, outside of that world don't see. I mean, everybody knows the Eiffel Tower is the symbol of Paris and so on. And so forth. Most people, first of all, outside India have no idea what that is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a symbol of India, it has to be the Taj, uh, the Pedro Mahal, which is called by its proper Hindu name. But, uh, the, um, does Delhi have a symbol? Is it the Lal Pilla? Well, I mean, and it, and I mean and the government focuses itself on the Red Fort, you know, the symbolic history of the Red Fort in, you know, Mughal and contemporary India, speeches from independence and so on. I mean, most people in Delhi, it's is a park, really. They go that's to that's yeah. true, but Aditi, who's sitting here in the front row, yeah. work has shown that really until relatively recently, it's very clear that the Qutub was the symbol of Delhi. I mean, it's, it's only pretty much, I'd say, in the last 20 years that, would you agree with that, that that's not as recognizable, that not every book on Delhi now has the Kutub on the cover, which yeah, it used to have. If you look at the Delhi Metro token, mm -hmm. it has the yeah, boss thing of the Kutub. Mm -hmm. And uh, just adding another point to Kathy's mention of the, the, the airbook tomb is the idea that, <coughs> there's also this idea that after the partition, like there's all these monuments that were lost to Pakistan. So there's probably also a way of remembering all that. To in to Muslim to just to, to just to say that to build this ibex tomb was a, a huge enterprise. You'd think it was very simple, right? Want to build a tomb over the original tomb, but because the buildings around the area um, had originally been owned by hin Hindus who had immigrated to India, it put the land kind of in limbo, and it took them something like eight years to actually legally acquire the land to build that tomb, which really goes to show that they were pretty determined to build it, because that is no short period of time um, in which to do that. Yeah. Mm. So thank you so much, Kathy. I have a quick question. Um, given the fact that the Kutub is such an important symbol, both in its time and certainly for um, you know, rulers in subsequent centuries, why don't we have more Qutub Minar copies across we, northern India? Well, we have many references to the Qutub, but not Qutub Minar copies. Okay, so if, I mean, I'm just, I, I left all this out. Luckily, you'll be glad to hear. But it, multiple structures, starting with building dip, even of Qutubish's time, have references to the Qutub. For example, the minarets on um, the mosque at uh, Ajmer, built by the, the addition added by El Tumish, has on uh, both its four corner bastions and also on the minarets references to the, um, the, the protrusions at the Qutub. You find them as far south as the Deccan. You find them in um, the Kilji Mosque in Dalatabad. You find them in the mosque. Uh, many of the Tughlaq mosques. I'm just giving a few examples. Um, s some of the, those large, massive ones in Delhi. I, I, I don't know if everybody in the audience knows what I'm talking about, so I don't want to go into it too much. Frequently, in the in the areas where the minarets start, they have references to the Qutub by the flanges. Um, this the the the, the hunting tower of Shah Jahan, which is actually. Um, par in, in the very southern part of Delhi, not very far from Palam Airport, um, is, uh, is, a, is a smaller copy of the Kutub. It, as you can see from the illustrations, the pictures I showed, it wasn't, it's not in very good shape, but it truly would have been, um, I mean, not, a, not an exact copy, but in, in art hi history terminology, people usually see a general copy as a copy, not exact. So it, it, it pretty much resembled the, the Qutub, I mean, not precisely, but in certainly in overall plan and appearance. Um, and so there's many references, most of them are, are, are the somewhat subtle ones, um, but um, uh, there are, there are a, a huge number, just not monumental minarets. Um, there, there are a few in Bengal, which again are not exact copies. They're fairly early. They're, they date pretty much to the, I mean, they date to the Sultanate period. At first, I would imagine the reasons that we don't really have them is that the minaret is a rather, I mean, it's not an easy thing to build. Inside of it is a spiraling staircase to go up. This minaret is intended as a watchtower. As time goes on, you probably have less need of a watchtower 
um, as, especially as mobile forces are really able to, um, to, to control territory better. Um, but I think, I, I, I would imagine that part of it, I mean, it's a really good question, but we don't get minarets after the 12th century in the Iranian world either. So we can imagine that they are not as necessary. It may be in part by, with the inability to, and, and I'm not sure about this, and I'm needless to say not a military historian, but it could be the part of being able to build stronger fortifications um, and taller ones where you could see better. The point of the minaret is to be able to see for a huge distance on a flat plain the dust that's being um, um, generated by the hooves of armies, horses, the armies of horses. Mm -hmm. It's that that is what its function was. That 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 could could be it, and for maybe the difficulty of building one. A good question, of which I haven't really given a good answer. Professor McCutcheon, I was just your uh, remarks put me in mind of the first time I ever saw the Kutub of Minar, uh, which was in 1960. I got on my little motors, a Lambretta scooter, and we were chugging out through this vast wasteland. There seemed exactly. to be rum and rubble everywhere. And suddenly here was this looming structure. I mean, uh, the uh, aesthetic impact of it must have been very different than it is now with all kinds of structures and buildings all clustered around it. Uh, I just wonder if that is a way, has it all affected how people think of the Kutub in sense of what has happened in the last 50 years to the area. All I can say about my last visit to the Kutub two years ago was I was leading a group of Cal Berkeley alumni and we had this Indian guide who kept telling us the Kutub represents the Muslim desire to conquer India and we had a huge fight and I never <laughs> spoke <laughs> So it's a very central and meaningful object in the way. I mean, Obviously, this fight is still going on in India, and, and one, of, one of the reasons I actually agreed to write a book on the Sultanate when I really think about the Mughals most of the time was to try to write a, a, a book that presented this whole area, because the book is actually on Maruli much more than just the Kutub, um, to try to present it in, in some sort of reasonable term, uh, a, a, a terms that was uh, theoretically to help set people straight. Of course, it probably didn't, but because no one's going to read it, but you have it neither <laughs> here nor there. But the whole area of Maruli has actually been transformed from what this, this massive building that you see everywhere, not just you know in that area, because um, this area it, it was, was after the sort of uh, 14th century um, uh, area in the, uh, after the area being an important urban center, <coughs> it shifts. Um, it becomes a very important Sufi center, which many people know, but it wasn't just the Shishtia, which I think many people think is really a Shishtia domain. In fact, there's multiple sects that are there that are flourishing, and then it becomes a major Afghan center. Um, and it was very important uh, for the sewers and then for the Lodis. And so you have all sorts of transformations. But it's very difficult to see that with modern roads that literally bisect, mm. um, you know, old religious complexes and two graveyards that are pulled down because they're just in the way. <laughs> and so the whole area has completely been transformed. I'm just making one more interjection, which is the British transformation of this area, I think, deserves some consideration also. I just didn't and, put and in of this course, talk. Uh, <laughs> it's my alleged ancestor to Sir Thomas Theophilus Metcalf <laughs> who set up his shop and lived in a yeah. local tomb. So I, it's just a wonderful I just didn't put, it's in this book I did, but it's not in this talk because, you know, I didn't want to keep you out of the sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. It was really enjoyable. Um, I guess it was kind of touched on a little bit, but I'm intrigued with um, not only ha the purpose of the Minar as a watchtower, but how it might have been built as like a spectacle of like not only seeing from, but also seeing to. See. Yeah, yeah, and kind of how there's that play going on if it was 
it must have been a conscious thing to have both. Well, yes. I mean, obviously, um, it. I think, I think, I mean, Jonathan Bloom has done an interesting study on the original purpose of minarets, which were, which watchtowers, and, and then they are transformed gradually over time into, like, religious mm -hmm. uh, elements for the call to prayer. But I think something that's really interesting that has not been worked on is that in the Iran, in the Persian-speaking world, there are many, many, many more mihrabs, I'm sorry, minarets <laughs> than there are elsewhere um, in a sort of the Muslim world. And uh, not all of them are truly functional. That is, not all of them actually have staircases that go up them. Um, and especially if you go to, say, let's say a city like um, um, Isfahan, and not, not the modern, not the Safavid part of Isfahan, but the older Seljuk part of Isfahan. What you see there are many of these very tall, slender minarets that were not either used for the call of prayer or not used f as watchtowers because you couldn't go inside of them. Um, I have a theory, which I have not worked on and don't know how actually would go about proving, but I imagine that they might have been um, domain markers. That is markers of, of territory, and they would be marked partly in, in, the, in the same way that, let's say, you're in a crowded city with narrow alleys, and you hear the call to prayer, how do you know where the mosque is? Well, you look for a minaret, right? Okay. So I'm sort of wondering if you don't have that same thing with these slender towers. So again, sort of, I know it sounds like a digression, but my point is that perhaps you're right, perhaps it's the to be seen thing, and of course in India the to be seen darshan thing um, could could easily, you know, really make this very effective. The fact that the 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 minaret ends up being taller than the original model is is going to be some sort of political statement. Now, of course, that doesn't happen right away, so it's a little hard to really follow through on that argument. But there's there's probably something to that. Um, but certainly, I mean, why did Sikandar Lodi put red and white up there? Well, it makes it a lot more visible. You know, if you just continued with a plain old brick, it kind of, you, know, you know, you don't really see the top as in the very spectacular way that you see it with that red and white. Yeah. And especially with if, seeing if, if the red and white is right, and of course I am. <laughs> if, no, seriously, but if the red and white is truly a statement of some sort of new kind of political entity, then visually that's, that's going to make a, make a statement. Yeah. Okay. Um, this will undoubtedly show my great ignorance of your field, but that's all right. I'm looking at this architecture and flashing back to Renaissance and pre-Renaissance Italy, and the color combinations of the medieval architects in Italy used that are rather similar. Uh, the jewel-like um, little tem temples and in Florence that are around the same date as the one you showed here. Um, and then the towers of San Gimignano are exactly <laughs> at the same time. And they were, uh, there was a kibosh on those after uh, the 14th century, uh, appropriate word. Um, anyway, I know there was some interchange in um, manuscript illumination and so on in India in early um, 12th century and earlier, but I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I mean, somebody can correct me, but I don't think there was that much connection in the 12th century between India and, I mean, there was. I shouldn't I mean, of course there was trade going on, but I don't, first of all, we don't really have that many illustrated manuscripts that survive. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that the idea of building towers is a unique idea. I mean, I, I, I think it'd be a little bit hard to really link these two things between Europe and India at this point. I think the Iranian link is pretty provable, and <coughs> um, I don't think there's any real doubt about that. Uh, I think it'd be a harder job to link it with Europe at that time. Oh, one question. Well, some conservators of uh, archaeological study of India have carried out uh, EDS direct analysis for the iron pillar for finding the trace sediment. 
But still, uh, it is wonder that why there is no rusting. It's uh, for because of the phosphorus, um, the the high degree of phosphorus in the iron uh -huh. is what keeps it from um, rusting. Uh, there's been a ton of studies on them. Um, there's there's no shortage of studies on the iron pillar and its its uh, mineral or, or its its mm -hmm. you know its its, iron, its mineral, mineral content. Mm -hmm. So it's evidently the high level of phosphorus that has done this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, um, I have a quick question. Uh, so I, I mean, I've heard me if I'm wrong, Greg. When you mentioned that on site there was a second dinar that was being constructed that was also large. So I was wondering. Um, if that were to have been completed, would that uh, well, what comparison would that have drawn with this seminar? Well, it would have been about oh gosh. First of all, I really doubt if it would have stood. <laughs> Problem number one. Um, but if the mosque were about six times larger than the original one, then I suppose the I, I mean I I actually have don't have the measurements to tell you exactly what it is, but the minaret was probably imagined to be about that. Um, but it, it's very unlikely that it actually would have stood very tall. I mean, could have made it. Um, so maybe it was just as well that poor Ali <laughs> hit the bucket so he didn't have to be too disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for the talk. Um, just uh, jumping off of Munis's point, um, I was just thinking that it's, it's kind of interesting to think about which monuments get copied and which ones just get continuously added on to. Um, so, yeah, and I, I was just thinking about, like, the Kutub is just this monument that has so many sort of layers to it, and it seems like all of the Delhi Sultans, or many of the Delhi Sultans, feel their need to kind of put their stamp on it. Um, so it almost, you know, sort of loses its, its, its ownership, um, and it becomes part of this just, like, a legacy of the Sultanate. And I was wondering too, because I, I just don't know. I mean, did the Mughals add anything to the Kutub? Well, um, the Kutub, I mean, the Mughals, um, as far as we know, they don't actually add anything. Well, no, they don't. As far as we know, they don't. But the Mughals have, but of course, Shah Jahan copies it for a hunting tower, so it's not like he didn't notice it. Uh, <laughs> he didn't notice it. Um, the, the Mughals, uh, I think, have a slightly leery view of this part of Delhi, the, the south, this Maruli area of Delhi, mm -hmm. um, in part, um, because, I mean, there, there are Mughal tombs down there, I'm so, and there are Mughal structures down there, and there are very few, if any, that are imperially sponsored. Um, but what we do have is that uh, Babur, when he first enters India, he does pay homage at the tomb of Bhaktiar Kaji, okay? But then, by the time of Akbar, the Sewers have taken, the, the guys who kicked Humayun out of India for a short while, have, have um, really taken a shine to this, the shrine of Bhaktiar Kaji. And the Lodis really anchor themselves there. The first Lodi ruler, Bahu Rodi, Lodi, um, is is very very linked to a non Shishti Dargah there. Okay, and I imagine that this puts and then Afghans in general, even those who are serving the Mughals, build a number of structures down there in the period of. Jahangir and Shah Jahan. This probably does not make the moguls, the imperial moguls, particularly want to have much um, sort of, they don't really want to pay much attention to that part. Mm -hmm. However, what we happens in the 18th century when the moguls lose Ajmer, which is where the main Shishji shrine is, the shrine of Munyadishwisti, <coughs> They then, when they lose that territory and they really no longer have easy access to pilgrimage there, they divert their attentions to the shrine of Bhakti Arpaki, which is just far enough away from the imperial capital, um, that so it's an overnight trip, right? So it seems like a pilgrimage 
<laughs> instead of just a local visit of your local shrine. So that replaces the attention that we formerly have at Ajmer. And in the 18th century and into the 19th century, even before the British start intervening, we get a huge amount of mobile patronage down, especially at the shrine of Bakhtir Khaki, which is literally next door to the Qutub Minar. And so, so that's when you start getting mobile intervention, but not at the actual Qutub. Well, there's a shrine, there's a, anyway, pretty much that's my, I painted a picture that's fairly accurate. No, that's really <laughs> interesting. I'm interested in the Lodi, so that's uh, really interesting for me. So, I mean, uh, yeah, just adding on to that, so do you think that the Mughal, the early Mughals, were particularly wary of that spot because of the Afghan Association? I think it particular? could, I think it could possibly that's be. I mean, again, it's, it's, okay. it's something that's, that I've been thinking about, and I think, I think that there's, um, good reason to think that. I, I mean, I really don't have a text that says, I, Mobile King, am going to avoid this area because <laughs> the Afghans and the Lodis were down there. But we have a huge amount of Lodi patronage. We know from texts that the early, well, there's only three Lodis, so early, <laughs> middle, and late, um, <laughs> were very much um, connected to, to that, that area. Thank you. So if, I know. If, no, can I just oh, absolutely. If nobody else, I, how do you do the photographs? I mean, they were so fabulous. <laughs> well, there's this gentleman. I did a lot of them, but there's this very nice gentleman in the back of the room who some of you might know. Um, his name is Rick Asher. He's extremely helpful. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you right now that taking a good photograph is almost impossible. It's called pollution. <laughs> it's extremely difficult. Yeah. Just a note on that last point. Uh, you know, the Qutub, and it becomes, you know, for the British off of the side of the picture. Right, right, the right, 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 of course. So a number of years ago, an undergraduate of mine submits his term paper to me, and the opening statement is, if you look out from the top of the Qutub Minar, you can <coughs> see all the way to the Red Fort. And I said, you're busted. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see 100 meters. And no one's allowed up there anyway. Because there's that terrible <laughs> tragedy there with yeah, the school the children. In the early 80s. In the right. 80s, the yeah. school children too, were, right, there was a right. panic and they were kill some children were killed. And you can't That's see 100 some. meters on a good day. You you from there. You're not seeing the Red Fort. No. Yeah. So this is uh, how the Qutub helped me with the plagiarism problem. <laughs> I wish I would have known I would have said it. Yeah. On that note, this is Kathy's second talk of the day. One more in Indian cricket parlance. It will be a hat trick. <laughs> <laughs> and on behalf of the Institute and the South Asia Art Initiative, a small gift to thank you for coming and speaking with us. Oh, that's very nice. Another bag. Another bag. Another bag.